everyone, let's stand and worship in Psalms 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, His empire shall bring. Good morning. We have a lot of prayer requests this week. A lot of a lot of folks who are not well today. We got some RSV that's gone around, just some little ones. So we want to pray today for for a li- little Olivia um, who's at Riley right now and even has a feeding tube in right now. So we just want to pray for a little Olivia. Praying for Lincoln today who might ha- have the same thing. Um, so the Williams are home. We've got people who have traveled. We got Verdi down in Florida. I think Dawn's down with her right now, so we want to pray for them. And there's just a lot going on right now. It's been a busy week, and some of us are probably still fighting food comas and high glucose and blood sugar levels and all of those things. So I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. It's okay. Good. Good. Mine was restful and peaceful and surrounded by my family and friends, and I am grateful myself. So. 
But in the midst of all that Thanksgiving, I am most grateful, not for turkey and all the stuff that we enjoyed, not for the Christmas decorations we put up on Thursday night. I'm grateful to be in the house of the Lord with God's people today. And I come expectant, expectant of God's presence here in this place, the Holy Spirit moving. Maybe you don't get goosebumps. Maybe you don't feel a feeling in your heart or something like that. But know this, God's Spirit's not a feeling, and God's Spirit's not goosebumps or an emotional high. It's the trust in this moment that here where God's people are gathered, this is where God is today. And when we acknowledge that, we can worship Him in spirit and in truth, and no matter how we feel emotionally, we can leave here knowing that we have touched the hem of Christ's garment today. Amen? Well, my, that's my prayer for you as you get to experience that and experience His love and His grace and mercy in your life today as we are gathered together. It's also our very last Sunday with Dave and Missy Sherman, who have been with us for five years. Um, Dave has been our connection pastor. I mean, I think it was something else before connection pastor. I can't remember how it's all kind of evolved over the past five years. But um, for them... They have done a lot of the intangibles of ministry around the church, a lot of things that I didn't have to worry about for a long time and that you never had to worry about. Guess what? We have to worry about now, Um, and we're going to figure all that out. But as we enjoy this last Sunday with our brother and sister, as we send them off to Pleasanton, Kansas, to their next ministry assignment where God has called them to go, we trust that God is with them, but we are also grateful for the years of worship and your service and your love to this church and and your friendship to so many of us. And so as we heartily worship, we heartily worship with our friends um, full of hope that God has their future in his hands and God has ours as well. Well, in that spirit, we're going to stand, we're going to say a word of prayer, and then we're going to greet one another for two whole minutes. You ready to do that? Let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We give you thanks. Thank you for our church. Thank you for the people who are gathered in this building Thank you for our friends. Thank you for Dave and Missy, for everything that they've done and everything they've accomplished here, God. How, uh, do we just ask that you send your Holy Spirit into our midst this morning, that we would indeed know in our heart that you are present in this moment. God, have your way this morning. May your name be glorified and make us a holy people. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen and amen. you got two minutes. Two, one. Find your way back to your seat. Hug your friends later. 
We're going to continue worshiping in Ephesians, Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15, 1 Peter. Um, verse, oh my gosh, now you're messing me up. Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the, in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. You gave your life for mine Nailed to the cross You crucified All my sin and shame It was washed by your mercy are the treasure I find, my reason for living, so let my life become an offering to the one who is worthy. All praise to the Lord most high, all praise to the one who my life, all praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. You storm the gates of my heart, the veil in between was torn. Apart. Now you hold the keys to the grave, cause you bring things to life, you roll stones away, all praise to the Lord most high, all praise to the one who saved my life, all praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven. up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life now is for you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. Amen. 
of heaven, my King forever. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. Couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away, and all oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all. been so, so kind to me. And all oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And all oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow and you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me You gotta sing it out There's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. serve it till you give yourself away and all the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God
Finally, we'll be reading from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Amen. You say a word of prayer with me this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we hear your message today. The words of your scripture reminding us of what you've done for us, your love for us. Reminded today on this Christ the King Sunday that you are seated high above all things. King above all kings. Lord over all lords. And God, we in gratitude today celebrate and worship you, our King. But God, we are also reminded today of what it means to serve you. As seen by the way we serve one another. Hard words, but good words to have a heart like yours. God, that is what we seek today. That we would be able to be like you. That by your Holy Spirit, you would remind us of your Lordship and propel us to live like you today. Make us a holy people. We surrender this service to you. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if my ushers could come forward this morning, we will receive this morning's tithes and offering. These are His tithes and our offerings. We want to encourage you to keep worshiping. This is a moment of worship. It's an extension of our worship. Worship is way more than music, way more than scripture reading, way more than celebrating and hooing and hawing. It's also generosity and giving back to the Lord, trusting that the one that we praise is also the one who is faithful and will supply for our needs. So let's continue our worship this morning in a word of prayer. Billy, would you want to pray over our offering this morning? My honor, yes. Thank you, Lord, for this day again. Thank you for so many things you've blessed us with, Lord. We are so grateful. We are not a real needy people, Lord, but we still need you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we want to ask that you take these tithes and these offerings, Lord. And I want you to take these in this church finances and multiply it. Mm. Bring glory to your name, yes. Lord, yes, as Lord. we bring glory to your name, Lord. And bless each hand that touches this plate, whether they give or they don't, Lord. Yeah, I amen. ask that you bless each and every person and do so mm. in your son's name. Amen. amen. Amen, amen. As the plates are being passed, let's sing a song of praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. It is right to sing God's praises. Well, we got a few. We got a few elementary kids today, so let's stretch our hands out in their direction. If they can't behave today, then we've lost all hope. Let's, let's say a word of prayer. And Father, we thank you for our children. God, I just pray that you bless them this morning with your presence. They would know deep down in their bones how much you love them. You would start a calling in their lives. 
and a nurturing for them to follow you. God, help them to sense that. Be with Pastor Caitlin as she leads them down that path of following you. And God, help us as adults in this church to love them, encourage them, and forgive them no less than you've always done for us. In the name of Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Bye, Felicia. All right, so some announcements today. Um, <clears throat> our youth group tonight, 3 to 5, so, or today, whatever that is, it all blurs together on a Sunday now, so 3 to 5, um, come and, and be ready for that. Deck the Halls will be decorating the church at 6 o'clock. We're giving a little dinner break for me in between youth group and decorating the church. It's weird, Advent falls on a weird Sunday this year. There's this weird gap between Thanksgiving and Advent which I was thinking about today. I, was, I felt weird coming in. And I'm like, I should have just decorated. Should have just done it anyway. But I, I love this. Um, I was reading this morning. Um, it builds some anticipation. You know what's coming next week. It's going to look a lot different. And if that's not a word for Advent, I don't know what is. So come tonight, 6 o'clock if you can. No pressure if you don't want to. Um, but it, help us make it look pretty. Uh, Wednesday's refuel, 6.30 here at the church. I don't know what we're doing right now. I didn't even have that on my radar. But we'll have something before we get into our Advent series. So join us 6.30. Bring a dessert or a snack thing to share in that first half hour. Women's breakfast is um, this Saturday morning, 9 o'clock here at the church. Um, I think the ladies have got all the breakfast stuff worked out. Carrie's got all the study stuff sitting on my desk and ready to go. Um, So it should be a great time. Really, I think we had 16 total women there last time. It was really, really, really good Good time. So I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. Nine o'clock here at the church. Um, And then third Saturdays coming up. Um, There are more third Saturday flyers back there for our winter series. So you can get them at Connection Point on your way out. It's got the little magnet on the back. Put it on your fridge. That's December 16th. um, And that's Christmas at Harbor. We'll have some crafts. We'll have some snacks. We'll have gifts. And even, even Santa will make an appearance for some of our young kids. So it should be a lot of fun. That's from five to eight. Um, so just mark that on your calendars. And then, uh, um, and I've got a, and, uh, the birthday anniversary and announcement card is all done. It's back there on Connection Point as well. But you'll see Christmas season, we do it a little different here at Harbor. So Christmas Eve, our, our 10 o'clock service in the morning is not a Christmas Eve service. It's our last Advent service. Then our Christmas Eve service, we have two every year. We do five o'clock where we do have child care available. So we encourage those that need child care to come at five. It only lasts about an hour or so, five to six. Um, and then we do another one a little later, eight o'clock, where we do not provide child care. And that's a great thing because it allows those who help watch the kiddos and take care of the kiddos to also participate in a full Christmas Eve service. So we want to encourage you to pick one of those, whatever works for you. You don't have to have kids to come at five o'clock if that works better for you, but there's two service options for you. Just make sure you, you spread the word. Five o'clock has childcare, eight o'clock does not. And then we always have a Christmas morning service here. No matter when Christmas is, it's always 1030 right here. We come in our pajamas. It's, you don't have to come. No one's ever had their arm twisted. I'm always pleasantly surprised by how many come though. It's always a good turnout. Um, and I, I, it's, it's like 40 minutes is all that it is. We sing the great grand Christmas songs, you know, joy to the world and hear all of the Christmas scriptures and all share a brief, br- very brief word. And it's really just a time to come together, get together on, I think, the most important day of the church year. And I know Easter is a big deal, but there is no Easter without the incarnation. And so I think if there's ever a time for for the church to come together, it's it's right then. So I try to make it 1030. It gets over about 1115. It should give you plenty of time to get back for lunch and do all your Christmas festivities. Um, And if you're like my family, the kids are up at like five jumping on our bed. So, you know, 1030 is a pretty good time. We just mark that on your calendar. Um, There's all the men's breakfast, the women's breakfast, third Saturday, all the special services. They're right here on that announcement card. So grab one um, on, on your way. Well, I mentioned that I'm pretty rested because I don't have to preach today. It's nice having an old retiree in your church <laughs> that, that can preach. So um, Mike has um, generously taken up the mantle to preach a word from the Lord to you today, and I am grateful for the rest. So Mike, come and 
lead us in the word today. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm glad you straightened that thing out about Christmas Eve, that I can come at five, because eight's after my bedtime. <laughs> and I don't have kids, but I was looking into renting some for the five o'clock service. Yeah, I knew somebody would raise their hand. I just knew somebody would raise their hand. All right, so let's get serious then. Uh, quit this foolishness, because I'm not renting kids. <laughs> I already had kids. Been there, done that. Christ the King Sunday. Interesting Sunday. I did some research on that. I, it's not my favorite holiday, so it wasn't on my radar. And I think Pentecost might be my favorite church year thing. But Christ the King. What does it mean to have Christ as your king? What, what does that mean? What is, what is that real? If you think about Israelite history, they had God as their king for year after year after year, and then they made a decision that they didn't want to have God as their king, and they wanted a human king. And that human king then, you know, Saul and David and all that stuff, and didn't all work out perfectly. So we're blessed to know we don't have to have a king. We don't have to elect a king. That our president is not the king. We're not going to elect Josh as king or me as king. We already have a king. And this guy, this being, not a human being, but he's a being, like you and I, because we're made in his image. He's a being, we're a being. He's a divine being, we're a human being, made in a divine image. He got a plan. He's got the whole thing laid out. And we heard it today in Matthew, which, you ever get distracted by the readings that go before the preaching and you think, that kind of fits? And so that's where I'm going. These are two verses that I wish they were closer together. Matthew 25, verse 34 and 41. Let me just read them to you and see what happens when you put these two next to each other. Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's what your king has for you. A kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. What was the foundation of the world? The Garden of Eden. And he has prepared for us the new Garden of Eden, the heaven, the kingdom. Verse 41 reads, then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Look at how many human beings God wants in hell. None. Kingdom is designed for, heaven is designed for us. Hell is designed for the devil. And what I want to talk to you about today is about your free will and your control. Okay? Free will and control. Notice that God says, from the foundation of the world, I've set it up. You can go up, you can go down. I don't know that those are the geographic locations exactly, but that's what we tend to think of. Hell down and heaven up. And it really doesn't matter. One of the things I keep telling Pam that I'm happy to be retired, it's not about going to a house on 800 North. It's not about not having to go to work. It's about being with her all the time. Heaven is not about whether it's up or down. Heaven is about being with him completely, all the time, not wondering about his presence, not sometimes feeling it, sometimes having the goosebumps, sometimes not having the goosebumps, sometimes wondering where he's at or why have you forsaken me, as Jesus said on the cross. So it's about being with him. So he's prepared that place, and he says, what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? And the longer I'm a Christian, the more I'm convinced that our free will might be one of the nicest gifts he gave us, but one of the toughest gifts to have. Okay? I don't know about you, but I made some bad choices. I tell people all the time, I don't know if I've said it here yet, but most of the bullet wounds in my foot come from my gun with bullets I bought, with the aim I took, and my finger was on the trigger. Now, that doesn't mean other people haven't sinned against me and stepped on my toes but the bullet holes are mine. The bullet holes are yours, okay? But God did not intend those. So I appreciate Josh giving me his pulpit. I know that you don't just trust anybody with your pulpit. And Josh and I are a lot alike, but we're different enough. But this week, I was channeling you, I think, a little bit because 
question kept coming into my mind. So I'm going to ask a question, not to imitate Josh, but because it really does fit. If you think about control in your life, zero to 100% control, one of the things that sometimes people think is we have no control. It's all up to my boss. It's all up to my spouse. It's all up to the president. It's all up to the supernatural powers that I have no influence on. And maybe I need to make sacrifices to appease the angry gods, whatever. How much control do you think you have in your life as a percentage? Tough question, I know. I knew there might be a little bit of pause. How much control do you think you have over your life? 50. The other 50 is external events. Okay. 50? 50? I'm a control freak. I take 150. <laughs> <laughs> if it's out of my control, it's just... <laughs> it's, mm -mm. Energy. So you wish it was 150. I do, yeah. Because it can't... You know it can't be 150. I know. That's what I'm just saying. There's not 150% of the hours in the week. You can't tie the 150%. You only have, <laughs> she could try. <laughs> we'll let you know when the experiment's over. 50% want as much as I can grab. Okay. 60%. The other 40% is externals. 75. I feel like I'm in an auction. 75, 75, I got to get 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 Okay. I can dictate a little bit of time, but it, it never goes according to the way that I lay it out. So I, I, I feel like 30% of the time I'm in control of what happens with me. Okay. Yeah. 75. 75? <laughs> I couldn't even figure out a number when I thought of that question. So it's kind of a trick question because nobody knows and doesn't tell you. But I want to tell you that you probably have less control than you think. That God wants you to have more control than you think. It's on your side. Because here's, here's eternal destination, and he says you have a choice. You have a choice. And I think it's one of the most significant words in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose. Choose. And he calls the people who choose rightly blessed. And he chooses the people who choose wrongly, cursed. And he sets up those roadblocks, I think, for the curse to say, wrong way, warning, warning, danger, Rule Robinson. Anybody old enough to remember that? Lost in space. Um, and the blessings to encourage people that they're headed in the right direction. So God, I think, wants you to take more control over your life, your schedule, your finances, and the things around you, then you probably think. Okay? I'm going to tell you why now, why I think that. We're going to go back to capture every thought, 2 Corinthians 10, 33 to 5. See, you're talking about goosebumps, Josh. Um, I know everybody's different. Some people get the goosebumps during the singing, some during the praying, probably very few during the giving. It's a short moment. But I like to give, uh, I figured out early on in terms of tithing, how am I going to give first fruits if I'm not a farmer? So I always write that check first. I don't get paid weekly, but I give weekly because that reminds me it's a part of my worship. So I get a little bit of goosebumps on that, but it's so short. My goosebumps come during the preaching. You might expect that from a preacher. But I'll tell you why. Because the most exciting part of me, for me being a Christian, is that God wants to send me to heaven. And because he gives me a free will, I can just take the ticket and sit and wait. I probably can. I don't know how that works. I'm not going to promise you that you should take the ticket, sit and wait, and you'll get there in heaven, I'll see you when you get there. I'm not going to promise you that. because It's not my ticket. But I can promise you this. If you wait and do nothing, you will feel the curse more than the blessing. If you want to live in the blessing as the devotional called the uh, Chick Shaver's book, Living in the Blessing, you have to be an active participant in the kingdom. And I think that's a blessing. God says, I'm going to take you to heaven where you're going to experience all the things that you want. 
Life will be perfectly balanced. Your schedule will be perfect. You will be able to control things. It, life will be great in heaven, right? We're looking forward to it. It's going to be an active thing, though. We're not going to be sitting on clouds strumming harps. Sorry, if that's what you were dreaming about. Not going to be. We're going to be tending the garden. We're going to be communing with God. Remember in the garden, they started off walking and talking with him in the day. Now we long to hear his voice because we're imperfect listeners. There we will be perfect listeners with the perfect God, the perfect king leading us every moment and every part of the day. But God says, if you want to start living as if you're already in heaven, let me show you how to live in the blessing and walk in the blessing. Let me show you the principles of the kingdom so that you can start leaning into and living in the kingdom already. So my biggest goosebumps come when I hear the principles for the practice of kingdom living. In other words, the best part of the scripture to me is, here's a principle for how life works. Here's, Mike, how you put it into practice. Here's how you receive the blessing. So I want to share with you today one of my favorite principles, and it's found in Corinthians number 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to start reading in verse 3. Man, i got to get my glasses adjusted here. And I'm going to stop in verse 5. It's the middle of Paul's defense of his ministry to the Corinthian church. Uh, they're giving him some grief. I can't believe that. No church would ever give a pastor any grief, any reason that he'd have to stand up and say, now, wait a minute, folks, let's look at this sensibly. But the principle is embedded in here, and we're just going to look at the principle. And it's in verses 3, 4, and 5. Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We just sang about lies torn down. There's no lie that God won't tear down to get to you. Strongholds only occurs here, and strongholds are those lies and fears we have in our life that keep us from experiencing the full truth and the full blessing of God. Only two foundations, only two weapons that the enemy has in this war that Paul is talking about, lies and fear. And God says, Paul says, we have two antidotes. God has two antidotes in this war for your mind, and for fear, there is faith. Okay? When I'm counseling with people and they have fear, I know there's only one antidote for that. The antidote is Find ways to get your faith to replace your fear. And if you're in fear, it's only a sign that you need faith. It's not a bad thing. All human beings are afraid, right? We all got things we're afraid of. Those fears are to warn us that things are not going right and that we need to say, I need to calm my fears because the king has got this. My fear comes when I don't got it, but the king's got it. So I need to replace fear with faith. Second one is lies. Well, we have a great antidote for lies, don't we? We have the capital T truth. Not just a truth that's like, oh, yeah, that's true, but like a capital T truth, the truth that makes a significant difference in the way you think, the way you behave, and the way you feel. It covers everything. Jesus is the truth. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, what he means by truth, the Greek word, I'm not a Greek scholar, and Josh may have to correct me later on, but the word truth, it has a flavor of it, at least a part of it, that says this is reality. You see, God wants to orient you to the reality, and the devil wants you to move off of reality. If I told you I was going to take you out into the wilderness, and it's no problem, I got a compass. It's only a couple degrees off sometimes. You're not excited, are you? Already you're figuring there might be a problem with our little expedition, right? The good news is we got true north. We got true north. Our God knows what true north is. He sent Jesus who was true north. You and I live in an exciting age because we got the book. 
We can read about Jesus. We don't walk with him and talk with him every day, but they only had that for three and a half years. You and I can have this for a long time, forever. This true north will point us in the right direction, but we have to pay attention to it. We have to pay attention to it. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to tear down the lies. We're going to take captive every thought. So let's talk about those words for a minute. Let's talk about capture. Capture means to lead captive or to make subject. In the Roman world, in the the world of Jesus, the time of Jesus, when you overcome the enemy, you took him captive and you took him to a place of exile. The reason you did that is because if you could assimilate them into your culture, their culture could disappear. When was the last time you met a Hittite out in Marketplace of Crawfordsville or Lafayette? And I challenge you, you won't even find a Hittite in Indianapolis or Chicago. Cultures were assimilated and gone. See, we have a kingdom that is a culture that is countercultural to the culture of any world culture. The world culture, the worldly culture, is the cosmos that Paul talks about. The cosmos is the culture we're against. We have a kingdom that is forever. The cosmos is the one that comes and goes and changes. You and I have a short attention span, not just because we have, well, I have ADD, not everybody's got it, but because we live so shortly. We don't remember the American Revolution. We don't remember a time before America. So we get blinders on from our culture. But this culture could end. This culture could end. That one never ends. Never ends. Was it the beginning of the world? Was it in the middle of the world? Be the end of the world. All the other cosmos are going to go away. But God is still going to be there. So he is asking us to take captive every thought, to take dominion and a power and authority. Remember in Genesis, he gave human beings after he made them in his image. He said, this image, one of the things it's about is power and authority. So I'm going to give you power and authority. This is your garden. Oh, I got one plant over here I don't want you to touch. I don't know why that was. Maybe it was just to prove that they could be obedient. I want to know, one of the first questions I'm going to ask Jesus, how long was it before they ate? I want to know. Because I was born a fallen creature. It wasn't too long before I bit the apple. What was it like to be innocent and to not know and to live in that goodness? You and I have an opportunity to find out. In fact, we have an opportunity to begin to live in it now, to lean into it. So he gave us dominion, and then guess what? When we bit the apple, Adam and Eve, wasn't maybe an apple, maybe it was a pomegranate, some scholars think, doesn't matter. They decided to go their own way. You hear this all the time as a pastor when you hear people's testimony. My testimony is I remember being in a garden shed doing something I wasn't supposed to do, and I thought, you know what? Lightning didn't strike me. That wasn't as bad as they told me. I think now that I'm 16, I'll start making up my own rules. Does that sound like that belongs in Genesis chapter 3? Had another person tell me, you know, when I got to be 18, the enemy said to me, you know, you've missed so many things by being good. Off they went. Every one of us have made a decision that sounds somewhat like that somewhere in our life that put us in charge instead of the king. We decided we would be the king or the queen of our own world. And that's where the downfall came. God said, you can't handle it. Out of the garden, get on the other side of the shining swords. Bad news. The good news is, Jesus came and took it back. Jesus satisfied the problem of your authority on the cross. And when he left, just before he went up into heaven, what did he say? All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth, and now I give it to you and I send you. He took back what we gave to Satan back in the garden, and he gave it back to us. So now Paul is telling us to use that authority properly in your life And I think it's for two reasons. Jesus recaptured it and delegated to us a limited authority. He has absolute authority, but he has the right to give me authority over my life. I think he does it for two reasons. One, he wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. 
God never wants anything bad to happen to you. He will let bad things happen to you if he needs to. I used to say, Sue has probably heard this, if one of my grandsons was falling off a cliff and I had to break his arm to keep him off the cliff, I would do it. God will break your arm if he needs to to keep you from going off the cliff. But he doesn't want to break your arm, but he doesn't want you to go off the cliff. So he gives us that limited authority so that we can live in the blessing and be a blessing. You ever wonder why when you're saved, you just think to go right up into heaven? Who would be there to witness to the people who still need to know about the goodness of God? So I think he leaves us here to be blessed and to be a blessing. Now, I need to tell you that this is one of the reasons I think that authority is greater than you think it is. If you think about who's the greatest authority in the American culture, it's probably the president. Could be the Congress, I don't know. Right now, they all look a little out of control to me. No political evaluations or comments, but they just look a little out of control. But when I was a kid, the president was in control. Do you know that what happens at your house is more important in the world than what happens at the White House? The White House can make a law. The Senate and the Congress can pass a law, and it doesn't change a single heart necessarily. It might change some people's behaviors, might change the way we do business, but it doesn't necessarily change hearts. But if someone gets saved, their life can begin to change. And guess what? The life of the people around them can begin to change. And the life of the people around them and around them and around them in bigger and bigger circles. My mom got saved one Sunday in March 1985, and uh, she started going to church because my uncle got saved. And my uncle was a pretty interesting guy. He was the only guy I knew that had a bar in his front room, remodeled it and had the bar in the front room. Uh, I heard stories about when he went off to the Navy, he invited 20 girls from Cedar Lake to his going away party. And they said, well, where are the guys? And he said, I don't need guys to have a party. I need the, I need the females from town. Pretty unusual guy. Well, he got saved and started singing in the church choir. And um, his four brothers and sisters eventually began to attend church. Kind of an unusual thing. That Pam and I actually went one time to see Uncle Jack Sing in the choir. We thought, well, that'll be funny. And they're having lunch afterwards. We'll get fed. We'll have a, be a little entertaining. We began to get convicted. And what happened was my mom's family, five kids, none of who would have ever been to church together and raised very poor, never saw a doctor as a kid, never had towels in the house, never had indoor plumbing, very poor, very poor. All five of them started going to church. All five of them got saved. Their spouses all got saved. The week my mom got saved, somebody said on the way out of church, if you want to see God move in your life, pray for somebody you think is far away from God. When your mom picks you out as far away from God, Tanner, not a good thing. My wife decided, my mom decided to pray for me and Pam. The very next Sunday, we were sitting next to her in church. Three Sundays after that, we got saved. We started attending this church in the old building. March 1985, March, actually it was April, Easter Sunday. We thought, wow, this is an exciting place to be. But not every Sunday is Easter Sunday for churches. For most of the time. And we went off to seminary after three and a half years, and after 10 years we came back and pastored, and after 13 and a half years we left and we went away and we came back. So I have an interesting perspective because I've seen this church in the 80s, the 90s, the aughts, the teens. And so... Uh, Anyway, what happens in my house, what happens in your house, is more important than what happens in the White House. That's why I think we have more control than we think, because God gives it. And God gives authority and power just like my dad did. My dad said, when you show me responsibility, I give you more authority. If you have enough power, you can have a key to the car. If you have enough power, you can set your own curfew. Show enough responsibility, you get authority. God wants to give you authority. He wants to give you authority. He wants to increase the control and the power that you have over your life to be blessed and to be a blessing. So capture. Second word is every. Every. I always say never say never. 
I don't like the word the way word like to use the word always because I'm on the hook for not missing. But when the Bible says always and the Bible says never, guess what? It means it. God always keeps his promise. God never goes against his word. So always and never. So this means I have the authority by the word of God, by the commissioning of God, to capture every single thought. Now, if that doesn't convince you have more power than you thought, I've lost you already. Because the truth is, if it says capture every thought, you actually have the ability to take every thought captive to Christ. Not a single amen. This is the crux of the sermon right here. If you don't have the ability to take captive every thought, you will not have that control that you desire in your life. Because thought is where it starts. What did Jesus say? You've heard, don't commit this behavior. Adultery, stealing. Where do those things start? Lust, coveting. They start in the seven deadly sins, which start in the thought world. So God is giving you authority to capture every thought so that in the seedbed where sin and blessing grow, you can root out all the seeds of sinful behavior before they produce fruit. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice to get all the weeds out while the roots are little? Wouldn't that be nice to get all the weeds out so that the fruit could grow? I think it's great that God puts fruit of the Spirit in us. But when the weeds grow, I sometimes get lost in the weeds. And my witness gets lost in the weeds. Well, I know he goes to church, and I know he talks about tithing, and I know he does this. But you should see when he's on the golf course. You should see what he says at work. You should see. You see, those weeds are a distraction. And God has a standard that is different than the standard I would set. Although I guess there's really no other real thing. God doesn't say you have to have less weeds than your neighbor. It's always easy to find somebody who cusses less or drinks less or beats his wife less. That's not a good standard. It's not a really good standard. Well, I make more than them. But we don't settle for that when we have our own achievement. God has a standard of purity. Purity. Now... You can say that's ideal. You can say we don't reach it. I'm going to tell you we reach absolute purity, absolute sanctification when we get to heaven, and God wants us to strain and reach for it now. I forget which philosopher it was said, aim for the stars, and if you only hit the moon, that's not bad. So we want to aim for purity. Purity is no weedy thoughts, no sinful behaviors. Purity is all fruit of the Spirit, nothing but good fruit for my blessing and the blessing of the world around me. So every means every. My favorite example of this is, uh, uh, don't judge me for this, but I liked James Bond movies when I was a kid. In fact, I read all the James Bond novels. Love spy stuff. He may not be the best example of a real spy, but it's pretty exciting. And Sean Connery is my favorite James Bond. After one movie, he said, I'm never going to make another movie, James Bond movie again. He thought he was too old, whatever. Twelve years later, he came back and he made a James Bond movie. Does anybody know the name of the movie? Never say never again. <laughs> and I learned my lesson from Sean Connery, never say never again. But when God says always, he means always. When he says never, he means never. Thoughts. Capture every thought. What's a thought? Here's where we're in a little bit of trouble as, as Greek-thinking people. There's two primary ways of thinking, even in the philosophy over the cultures of, of millennial, kind of a Hebrew way of thinking and a Greek way of thinking. The Hebrew way of thinking is very Matthew and Old Testament. Metaphorical, poetic, uh, this means this, and it's about feelings and emotions. Well, not totally. Greek is about, tell me the formula, A, B, and C. If you like Luke better than you like Matthew, you're probably a Greek thinker. Most Americans are Greek thinkers. That's why, for most of us, including myself, the Old Testament sometimes is like, what? 
He's like a chicken. He's got wings. I thought he didn't have a body. You know, the, the metaphorical stuff. I'll read a psalm and I go, what does that mean? And she'll go, well, it means. And then she tells me, or I'll read a commentary. Oh, it makes sense. But I'm a Greek thinker. And in Greek thinking, we tend to divide things out so that we pick apart the whole until it really, you know, once you dissect the frog, it ain't really going to be a frog again. Okay? So Greek people got to be careful. Hebrews, it was more uh, wholeness. So when they said the soul... They meant the way I thought. Do you ever read in the Old Testament where it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. That ain't right. We don't think in our heart, do we, Josh? That's where my feelings are. My thoughts are up here. And Hebrew thinkers, it's all together. Probably the closest thing we have in American thinking is the self. There's, There's something in there that when you die, it goes away and we're left with this body, but everything that's not body is probably self or soul. In the Greek word, it's psyche, where we get psychology from. But the thinking and the thoughts and the feelings, that's, that's myself. That's the core of who I am. So in Hebrew thinking, when they say the heart, they're saying the heart of the matter, the core of the matter. Not like bum, 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 heart. Okay? So when it says take every thought captive, the Greek word is noema, I think is how you say it. It means mind, understanding, intellect, heart, soul, feeling, or purpose. It's all that stuff. And when I read it, I think, oh, it's what happens in my brain. Mm. It's the thoughts and the feelings and all of that stuff all together. All of those parts are to relate to God all together, all at once. Don't think of your thoughts and your feelings as separate. They're all part of self. They're all part of your soul. They're all part of who you are. So when it says, take your thoughts captive to Christ, it's talking about it's going to work with your feelings and your thoughts and your personality, your intellect, your understanding, all those things together, which is a good thing. Because see, my thoughts lead to my behavior, which gives me my feedback from the world, okay? In psychology, we, we, got, we think of people as a triangle. Their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Those are the three things we think. And in psychology, when we're trying to help people change, and people do change, right? Amen? Amen. I just watched a whole show last night on how a certain group of people don't change. And the, the argument was, do they change or don't change? And it's like, how long do you have to live before you notice people change? Sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're good. But we're called to change. Would you agree God wants to change you from who you are 2023 to 2024? Yeah, yeah absolutely. He's here to transform your life. That's a pretty big word. That's not a minor change. Remember my friend Wally Schlink wanted to turn over a new leaf. God wants to change you deep at the roots. This is what we're talking about. The roots of who you are start in your thoughts. I am a cognitive behavioral therapist in the world of psychology. And the reason I am is because I believe God reasons with me. He says in the Psalms, come, let us reason together. And he speaks to me. Sometimes his ways are above my ways and his thoughts are above my thoughts. But he has revealed himself. One of the most amazing things about God to me is that he would choose to reveal himself to me. Why me? All these people, 7 billion on the planet now. How many ever billion lived before? But God wants me to know him. And if he wanted to play hide and go seek, I could never find him. And when we hid in the garden, God said, where are you? Not because he couldn't find them. He wanted them to take stock of where they were. And he wants us to take stock of where we are. But So I believe that God created us with the will, the freedom of choice at the top. That's the part that's supposed to be in control, the freedom of choice. So that's why I ask you, how much freedom and how much choice and how much control do you think you have over your life? And then he reasons with us. And then the the feelings, he desires for us to have peace and comfort and joy in our heart, a peace that passes understanding, uh, the comfort that comes directly from God and the joy that doesn't make any sense with the circumstances. Those are internal gifts of the Spirit for choosing right behavior. 
So we think and we reason with God, we look at the scripture, we make a choice based on that, and then we get the feedback. Now, I'm telling you something that's totally upside down, because in the world we live in today, it's all about feelings. You know, Josh, if I feel that way, I got to tell you. I'm just being honest with you, Josh. I didn't like that. You hurt my feelings. Whatever. It's not about feelings, though. Your feelings are indicators, not dictators. If you only write one thing down, that might be the most important thing to write down. Your feelings are indicators, not dictators. If your feelings are running your world, I got bad news for you. Your feelings are based on circumstances. And if you're running your life based on the circumstances and what other people do, behind the circumstances, like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, is the enemy. And if you're run by the circumstances, the enemy is actually running your life. And he does not love you. He does not want the best for you. He has not created a place in heaven for you. He is not giving you control and a sound mind. He is doing everything he can to steal and kill and destroy you, the people in your house, the people at your job, and everybody you touch. So how do we get that? We ask God to flip us right side up and help our will to be in charge by reasoning with him, and then comfort, peace, and joy comes. That's why Jesus said, don't slap the other guy when he slaps you. Now, let me let's just break that apart for a minute. If Pam slaps me and I think, you know what? She's not allowed to do that. I'm the husband in this house. And I slap her back. That'll teach her. Now, a couple of things have just happened. Number one, I've just sunk to her level, right? Yeah. If she did a wrong and I did a wrong, how many wrongs does it take to make a right? Well, I was taught two wrongs don't make a right. Maybe three does. Maybe if she slaps me back, and then I slap her back. How many? God says, love overcomes hate. Right behavior overcomes bad behavior. Holiness overcomes sin. If I want to be on the right side, I don't slap back when people slap me. I have a right to slap them. They slap me. Court of law would say, that was self-defense. That's not the way we live in this kingdom. This kingdom that's the way we live in this kingdom. But we don't live in this. We're citizens of this kingdom. So make sure that you're not letting your emotions run your life. It will run you wagged. It will wear you out. And I hate to tell you, but I've been on the planet almost 70 years. I think that's getting worse in the culture we live in. And you can find more justification for it. And you can be a snowflake. And you can say, I go to my happy place. I go to my safe space. Whatever you want to say. But that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Because I don't need a safe place. I got a safe place. I got a safe place. I got a safe place. The world may beat me up all week long, but when I come here, I got a safe place. I'm reminded of my safe space. And if she slaps me, she's never slapped me. She's never going to slap me. Just, just an example, folks. If she slaps me, I'm not going to slap her back. I've already made up my mind. Just say no. Not a bad idea. Now, it's not always that easy, but the more things you think about in advance and you decide in your mind, the better your behavior will be headed towards true north, and then the blessing of heaven becomes the blessing of today. Does that make sense? Capture every thought. Reason with God. Make choices. And here's why I don't like that, Billy. I want control. But he says, if you're going to have control, you've got to be responsible. Responsible. I had a pastor one time, very smart guy. He said, I try to encourage people to join the church. In America today, people do not like to join the church. And there's two reasons. I can show you the research. Two reasons people don't like to join church. Kind of building responsibility. And he said, but I have to tell you, there's two reasons people most need to join the church. Accountability and responsibility, exactly. You see, I would be glad to be unaccountable. That's my fallen human nature. It's not what God wants. He wants to hold me accountable because he wants me to be responsible. So I need the church. I need a pastor. I need a congregation. I need a wife. I need all kinds of people to help hold me accountable. But my accountability starts up here. I'm accountable and responsible 
for my thoughts and my behaviors, and then God gives me the feedback through my feelings. All right? Take, capture every thought to make it obedient to the kingdom. Uh, I've already talked a little bit about obedience, just simply meaning compliant with, in line with the true principles. Uh, Josh has been talking about the seven deadly sins and the virtues. Uh, you can't know what's wrong with you. You can't get fixed what's wrong with you until you get a diagnosis, because good diagnosis is what leads to good treatment. I've seen people get wrong diagnosis, get the wrong treatment. Doesn't work, okay? So your problem is not your boss. Your problem is not your spouse. Your problem is not your church. Your problem is right here in the two shoes you put on this morning, okay? Now, I'm not saying those other people are never a problem. I'm only saying the one God gives you authority to work on is your own. I always know we're turning a point in marriage counseling when I'm working with somebody and the, the husband looks at the wife and looks at me and says, you mean I'm supposed to figure out how to be the best husband instead of coaching her on how to be the best wife? And I go, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Because the truth is, and I'll admit to this fault, because I'm a psych major, because I'm a counselor, I thought I could teach her how to be a good wife. What are you laughing at? That's not that funny. <laughs> I really thought I could. Do you know what? I don't know nothing about being a wife. <laughs> Didn't I tell you to hold that amen till later? <laughs> I'm not a female. What would I know about being a wife? Seriously. But neither do I need coaching on how to be a husband. Oops, see that amen will get you in trouble. Because <laughs> she's not a male. She doesn't know. Okay? So God says, Mike, Take care of your stuff. Now, my responsibility to others, I'll give you this as an example, is to be the crucible, the container, so that the Holy Spirit can work on her. Okay? The encourager. She'll say, you know, when Josh was preaching about this vice, I think, you know, honey, I don't see that on the outside. It must be small. How can I help you with that? How can I pray for you on that? I don't have to change her if the Holy Spirit's going to change her. And I have to tell you, after years of doing marriage counseling, if I'm yelling in the ear of my spouse what they ought to be doing, they probably don't hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. So shut your mouth and let the Spirit whisper and be the support person that they need. And it's true. Diagnosis and treatment, whether it's the human body, whether it's cars, whether it's relationships, our purpose is to be guided and directed by the laws and commandments, suggestions, and guidelines. I almost don't like that they're called laws and commandments. And Pam gets upset with me when I say this. The Ten Commandments should be called the Ten Suggestions. Okay? Now, the reason I say that is because God gave me free will. And sometimes when I hear commandments and law, my fallen human nature says, I don't have to do that. And the truth is, I don't have to do that but I disobey at my own peril, right? Because these are the principles. See, if there are 10 principles and I discover a principle, I want to be blessed. I want to live by the principle. Once I get it, I get it. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm going to encourage you to do is to make sure that you are spending some time in the service listening for the principles as we preach, as he preaches. You spend some time reading the book, looking for the principles so that you can be blessed, so that you can live according to the true north, so that you can not only be blessed, but you can be a blessing and a witness to others. Don't worry about the blessing and witnessing of others, because I promise if you do it in your own two shoes, other people will see it. I like what Peter says. Be ready to give an answer. Whew, that takes the pressure off. You mean the other people are going to ask me questions? Yes. yes. If they see a difference in your life, they're going to say, well, you went through this, and I would have never made it through. How did you make it through this? Well, you know, at the beginning of that, one of the things I thought was, how do people go through this without the Lord? Well, the Lord makes a difference when that happens in your life? Yes, let me tell you how, about how that works. All you have to do is be in them shoes, follow the true north, take every thought captive, and begin to live by the principles as God leads them out. Your life will be blessed. Others will see it. They'll ask you, and you'll be able to give them the answer. Jesus. Jesus. 
because they answered everything. Now, maybe they don't want to hear Jesus the first time you talk to them, but they might want to hear, you know what? There was a joy in my heart that just can't be taken away from that. Worst thing that's probably ever happened to me, you all know about the last year, I think it might be the worst thing, second to worst thing, was when our granddaughter passed away. One of the good things about living by the principles is that it's not about this world, it's about the next world. And I think Sue might even remember how hard that was for us. And Sue might even be able to tell you that the joy never left our heart. I had unhappy days, but I never had joy, days without joy. Never had days without peace. Had some difficult days. But when people say, how did you get through that? I say, you know, I sometimes think that Footprints poem is a little sappy. But it's absolutely true in the days that I can't walk beside him. He will carry me. He will carry me. And he doesn't take away the joy and the peace that passes understanding because I can't explain to you why I had peace. Passes understanding. I can't understand and I can't put words to it. I can't explain it to you. The joy never left. The joy unspeakable is, uh, I don't know. And God's comfort. I'll never forget when he said to me, Mike, don't you want your grandchildren to be in heaven? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. I said, I got one. Let's work on the other three. I got one. Let's work on the other three. Do I miss her? Yes. Do I look at teenagers today and think, could that be what she'd be like? Yep. But I know where she's at. I know how to get there, and I'm planning to see her again because of his promises and his ways. Taking every thought captive that I might be obedient to the kingdom of Christ. Who's in charge? He's in charge. He delegates to me what power and authority I might have. There are two kingdoms and three voices vying for your attention. Two kingdoms, we've already talked about them. One in Matthew, or both of them in Matthew. Are we going up or are we going down? Are we living for him or are we living for self and the enemy? Because those two are connected. So those three voices in my head, this is the practical part of the sermon now. There's three voices in your head, you're not crazy, Okay. We all talk to ourselves. One of the things that counselors work on the most is self-talk. If I hear Josh say, well, you know, I'm just so lazy sometimes, I'm gonna say, Josh, I don't allow people to talk about you that way. I'm not gonna allow you, my friend, to talk about my friend that way. Let's turn that around to positive self-talk, okay? Now, it's gotta be realistic and stuff like that, but we all talk to ourselves. The cartoon has a little angel and a little devil. That's actually a pretty theologically sound representation, except the devil never gets inside your head. He's always out here. That's why you have thoughts and he doesn't know what they are. But if you speak them out loud, he hears them. Okay? And he's a very astute observer of human behavior. And he sometimes knows you better than you know yourself. He sometimes knows you better than you know yourself. Because he's been observing human behavior longer than you have. The good news is the little angel doesn't sit on your shoulder. He lives in your heart. If you're a Christian, he's in here. And he can nudge you. He can whisper to you. He can lead you and guide you if you let him. This is why Pentecost is my favorite Christian holiday. I don't know if I could make it without him in there. I'm glad to live in the day and age where the spirit resides in my heart and leads me and guides me because I have the general principles here. But remember, I talked about moving from principle to practice is where the blessing is. The practice is I have the coach right in here. And he says, remember the principle we talked about in church? Remember what Josh preached on a month ago? Yeah? Well, here's your chance, Mike, to walk in that principle and put it into practice. So I got those three voices in my head. My job is to turn down the voice of self Turn it down. It's not always on your side. Turn down the voice of the enemy by listening to feelings. He's on the feeling channel. Let's turn the feelings down, the temptation down. Let's turn the enemies to voice down. And let's turn up the Holy Spirit so that he's the loudest voice in my mind. Now I've taken every thought captive to Christ and I say, Jesus, 
What do you think about this? No longer I, but he who lives through me. Anybody in here got a WWJD bracelet on still? I always thought it should be WWJT. Not what would Jesus do, but what would Jesus think? Because if I know what Jesus would think, I know what Jesus would do. And if I know what I ought to think, I know what I ought to do. Because God desires to lead and guide me from blessing to blessing to blessing to ultimate blessing. And he says in his word, I didn't design that other place for you, Mike. Why would you want to go there? Why would you want to lead your family or anybody in the world there? I'm leading you to heaven. And the peace and the joy and the comfort and the blessings I give you today are only a down payment on the ultimate that I have planned for you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you are good to us. The song we sang is uh, just amazing. You, you searched us down. I didn't find it. You found me. And you walked down walls to get to me. You knocked down strongholds in my mind and thoughts that I had that were wrong. You, you put up with my uh, feeble attempts at walking with you in the beginning. And, but, Father, I thank you for maturity and transformation. I know some people winced when I said those words probably because they didn't know me before. But if they think I'm a mess now, they should have seen me before you found me. You are cleaning me up. You are helping me take every thought captive to Christ. And I trust you with every piece of me. All of my thoughts, my intellect, my feelings. And I ask, Father, that you continue to guide me and the others around me and the people that I minister to and the people I preach to towards that true north where every day is a blessing. Every day is a blessing to know you and to be known by you, to have you open your word to us, to have you invite us to let you be our king. You are the king. The question is, will you be the king of our heart? I pray, Father, you help each of us to grow up, to be transformed into your image, that we might have more blessing and more control over ourselves, and that by doing that, Father, we might be a blessing to the world around us. Father, we thank you for all the ways you work in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. That was good. That was a good reminder. I've, this week was a tough week uh, for my family early in the week because I'm, contrary to what you may believe, I'm run by my emotions sometimes. And uh, it's been a good sermon to hear. And I, I really wanted to just say that when you talked about capturing and having every part of me being assimilated into God's kingdom, um, that's what I want controlling my life. And I hope that's what you want for yours. And as we receive communion this morning, I think this is the physical reminder that God has given you power to take control of your emotions and your intellect and your thought and to have them assimilated into God's image and God's purpose for your life. And so as we receive that, Dave's going to come and he's going to serve with me one more time, serving you as his church, and let's receive grace this morning. You need one more time to wash your hands. You can do what you want after this. <laughs> we'll make everybody else sick. You go ahead. All right, let's, uh, let's say this Apostles' Creed with our brother and sister one more time. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
was on the night that our Lord was betrayed that he took a loaf of bread and he prayed. And after he prayed, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Take this and eat this. Remember me. And likewise, he took the cup. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you, shed for the many. Take this and drink this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul reminds us as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes. And as you receive this grace again, to reiterate, may you physically be reminded that you can be in control of your life. Whatever might happen to you, you might not be able to control, but you can respond every reaction and every response. And that's the gift that God has given you by the giving up of his control so that you could live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again give you thanks. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your spirit empowering us to live and to love and to follow you and one another. God, as we receive this grace this morning, May your presence be felt and known. May we be blessed. But God, as we also receive this blessing, may you empower us to be a blessing to the people around us. It's in the name of Christ we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Come, receive grace this morning. All right, so we've decided, I made the decision this morning that this next church year is the year of no leaving. <laughs> it has been declared. 
in that spirit of never leaving, stand up. <laughs> and please leave, but make sure you come back. <laughs> Hold out your hands. Take it all. And to our brother and sister, Missy and Dave, go in the peace and the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. May you minister well, may you love well, and may you be loved in return. And for all of you, go in the peace of Christ, knowing that he is with you this week, and be a beacon of hope in a lost world. Go and be a blessing. Go in peace.